we've been talking about the basics of probability tree learning, and now it's time to put a little bit of that to code. We're going to do two different uh, examples, both of which uh, are derived from data that we've worked with before. First, we'll play a little bit with the same 2D classification problem that we had with support vector machines. This is a nice visual type of problem that's uh, easy to get our head around what's going on. And then we'll drop back to uh, the baby action recognition problem. And I'm making a small change to the way I've set up the problem, and I'll, I'll point this out in the code as we get there. Uh, but one of our challenges with, the, with this particular problem is that there's this tremendous imbalance between the positive and negative examples. In addition, for the events that we identify as being the positive examples, the baby state, the, in terms of arms and where the arms and legs are and how they're moving, is not really all that different from that one sample that's labeled as positive to the neighboring uh, two samples. What we had been doing before was labeling the event uh, case as positive and the surrounding uh, surrounding time steps as negative examples. And, and this has certainly uh, presented some problems for some of our classifiers. So I'm making some adjustments. Uh, first off, what we're going to do is uh, allow the, the samples leading up to the event uh, to be considered as positive. And then, and because the baby's limbs can be changing their state as the robot begins to move in a way that's very much correlated with the movement of the robot, what we're going to do is actually drop a bunch of the samples right after the event. And, and this way we uh, have a bit more clear distinction between what are positive examples and what are negative examples without this interference of the robot. So let's turn to some code. So on the server in the Git repository, there is a file called tree simple uh, skeleton. The uh, imports, the only real difference here is that I've added the tree regressor uh, the tree classifier and uh, the book talks about uh, using export graph viz. This is a, a nice way for us to visualize what's going on with our decision trees uh, after they've been learned. So I'm importing that. So I'm going to do that. Uh, we before we had a little function that uh, did a scatter plot for us. I've made some modifications so that we can actually see our labels. And the plot probs function has not changed at all. So this is what's generating our ROC curves and computing area under the curve. Uh, the data set is classification underscore data dot pickle. And let's go ahead and look at what that data looks like. So I'm going to uh, use our function that we defined above. Okay, so this is the, the raw data. The positive examples are in red. The, the negatives are in green. One thing to keep in mind is that we're actually, the, the distributions are actually overlapping uh, to, to uh, some degree. Uh, and that just comes from the nature of the way I generated the, the data. These are fundamentally just 2D Gaussian distributions. I laid down five of them, two of which were labeled as positive, and, and the remainder, remainder were labeled as uh, negative, generating negative examples. With our support vector machines, if you recall, uh, an individual support vector machine really wanted to have a nice clear boundary between positive and negatives. We'll, we'll see that things can be a little bit different in this context. All right, so for our classifier, we're going to just use the, the simple decision tree classifier that's available out of scikit-learn. And I'm going to uh, set max depth. Uh, for now, just for fun, let's set it to, uh, to one. So it's a really shallow tree. And because our decision tree classifier object adheres to the scikit-learn standards, we can use cross-val predict on, on top of it. Uh, so, so again, we're doing tenfold cross-validation, and uh, the predictions here are uh, all with respect to validation data sets. Computer confusion matrix, print that out. 
So, so just at the face of this, we have a fair amount of mass down the diagonal, but we have a lot of uh, negative examples that are being classified as uh, positive examples. With our decision tree classifier, at least the way that we are querying it with CrossVal predict, uh, it's giving us a crisp label, but we can also ask for uh, probabilities. And again, I had to swap the uh, the, the probability, this is, what we were getting out of this was the probability of uh, predicting uh, a negative label and for everything we're doing, I really wanted to be showing probability of predicting a positive label. So, so let's look at our results from our prediction. And, and there we go. So with this one layer deep decision tree, we're not able to do very much with, with, with this data set. And you'll notice that nominally there's a dividing line here uh, along X1 is about seven or so uh, between what's labeled as green, the negatives, and what's labeled as red, uh, the positives. The, the fact that this isn't a crisp line comes from the fact that we don't have just one decision tree. We actually have 10 different ones that are all making slightly different choices about what that threshold ought to be. We'll, we'll address that here uh, in uh, a moment. But first, let's look at the probabilities that are being predicted. So for, to do this, we'll have to run uh, cross-val predict uh, a second time, uh, where we're asking for the, the probabilities explicitly. As with our earlier examples, with this problem, we happen to be predicting the probability of uh, labeling a, a, a negative label, and we really want to be talking about the probability of a, a positive. So I'm flipping the uh, polarity here of the prob A uh, vector. All right, so now let's look at what we get out of these probabilities, and that's our plot probs function that we've defined above. And there we go. So there's our TPR versus our uh, FPR. The, the two rates are very similar up to about this threshold, and then they take a, a, a turn where there's some reasonable separation. We're getting a KS distance of a, about 0.35 or so, which is not too bad. Here is our ROC curve, and that's not a, a bad curve to end up with. Uh, the area under the curve is right there, 0.668. For this particular problem, we certainly want to be doing better, but, uh, but we are doing something quite reasonable. Okay, before we play with the architecture at all, I, I did want to uh, look at the uh, structure of the tree. And uh, to do that, I'm fitting one more classifier with the entire training set, pulling out the predictions for those training elements. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the, the plots. Uh, the, the scatter plot that results from that, but then we're also calling export graph viz. Uh, to, to do that, we're handing it a, a reference to our model. We specify what the model output is. Um, this is uh, a, a dot file, uh, and, and it's, it's just a programming language that describes graphs. And, and then I'll show you how to work with that here in a moment. And in this case, I've selected a couple of other parameters for this export. So, so th this is the resulting scatter plot. In this case, we have exactly one, one model. And you can see very clearly the dividing line here sits at x, x1 as something on the order of about, uh, about uh, seven or so. We've now produced a, a dot file, and let's look at that. Let me get into the right directory here. So this is the directory that I'm working in. You'll notice that there's a, a model dot dot file. Hold on, just I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to roll this back here. The way I had my environment set up. Uh, for some reason, the file is getting written into the directory I did not expect. Um, but here's the file, model dot dot. It was just uh, modified here uh, a moment ago. Um, let's take a look at that. Uh, to do that, I'm going to go ahead and launch a terminal. And this gives us a 
uh, a bash shell uh, in in the uh, on the server. Um, I'm going to cd. So cd stands for change directory. Um, I'm hap I happen to be changing directory to uh, a place where all my files are located uh, on my hard disk on on my laptop. Uh, this is not on the server, so this is going to look uh, quite different than what you'll use. Um, but fundamentally, you're going to cd down into the directory that you're working in. OK, so there's our model dot dot. And let's take a look at it. So, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, describing what all is going on here. But fundamentally, uh, what it what the programming language uh, talks about is that it goes through and it defines uh, the different nodes in the uh, uh, in the graph. It it also talks about how the nodes are connected and and in what way. And then a bunch of this code is about uh, specifying what the labels are and how things should be colored. There's a uh, program that's available. Uh, on my machine, and by the time you're seeing this, it should be available on the server as well, called dot, which translates this textual description of a graph into some sort of a visual. And in particular, we can ask for, say, a PNG file. So that's a, uh, a dash big T PNG. And we have to specify the input file. And dash o means specify, we're specifying the output file. We'll just call that model.png. OK, so it executed without any errors. This particular file was already there in my list um, because I had been doing some, some work earlier, but it has now been overwritten. Um, and you can see the, the time has uh, updated to just seconds ago. So if I double click on that, we can get our, uh, our decision tree. And, and there we go. So our split is x1 is, uh, in this case, less than or equal to 7.5, which was about where I was uh, guessing. Uh, this is the probability distribution from the, from the uh, perspective of this particular node. So it's seeing, it, it's seeing 300. It's considering these as positives and 200 negatives. This just has to do with how, we, how I presented the data to the model, but, but you're seeing, you're seeing the, the full set of uh, training set samples here. And, and you'll notice this dividing line then yields two leaf nodes, and you can see the, the Gini scores for each one of those and how many samples fall down into each uh, category. You'll notice for the right-hand branch here, it actually does a fairly good job of separating uh, the two classes. So we only have 13 samples uh, in, in the uh, second class. Whereas for this, this leaf node, the distribution is very similar uh, across the two. And that, and that really captures our uh, intuition about, uh, uh, about what we were seeing in the, uh, in the scatter plots. All right, so let's go back to, to here and let's, let's play a little bit more with our model. So we had a max depth of one. Let's try a, a two. Notice that this executes much quicker than the uh, support vector machines. So, so here's the resulting scatter plot. You'll, you'll notice now we're, we've got some green down below here. That's the new thing that's appeared. If we look back at the original distribution, nominally green is at the top and the bottom and we've got reds down the middle and and that's where it's set up it's uh the the model has set up its dividing lines it's looking at both uh at x1 here and here uh and capturing the bulk of the red cases but uh but but uh this region here that uh that that are really negative examples are still being labeled as positive so let's look at what happens when we predict uh, probabilities. Notice that our AUC has gone up quite a bit, 0.826. There's our ROC curve, which has improved a lot. And then finally, let's uh, train with one single model with all of our data. And, and here you can see very clear 
uh, delineation here and uh, along the bottom, although there's this segment right here. So th we'll be looking for that in, in our model. Uh, as part of executing this particular uh, cell, I've, I've generated a new version of model.dat. So let's go ahead and convert it. By the way, up arrow in uh, the bash shell will just allow you to explore all of your previous commands. And let's load up that new model. So there's our depth two um, model. And you can see uh, we still have our, the, that, that first split again was still at x1 uh, is less than or equal to 7.5. And, uh, and then here's our other big split, x1 is less than or equal to 2.2. We're doing a much better job now with this uh, distribution here. This is okay, but there is some real differentiation between positives and negatives, uh, as well as here. This one, there isn't much of a differentiation, but, uh, but we don't have a whole lot of samples hiding down in this particular case. Okay, so let's, let's be a little bit more uh, extreme here. So I'm going to set max depth to five and see what it's uh, able to do here. All right, with, with this bigger uh, model, you'll notice that it's now labeling everything inside of here as, uh, as negative, most of which really are negative. Let's look at the probabilities. Our AUC now has gone up to 0.92. You can see our TPR versus our FPR has uh, improved uh, quite uh, dramatically. So our KS distance is almost 0.8 now. And there's our a ROC curve. So this is the kind of ROC curve that we really like uh, when we're doing uh, real problems. All right, let's go ahead and uh, train everything on the one, uh, the one model. And uh, you'll notice that it's, it's labeled this intermediate zone as all green, although what's interesting is that there's a red dot right here. Um, what's happened is that we have such a big model now that it's able to uh, isolate uh, individual samples or small number of samples in some of the rules that it's learning. With such a big model, we may, it, it starts to get hard to look at these trees, but we can still interpret them. Uh, to some to some degree, uh, so here is the tree. Let me let me drop into a slightly different mode here. It's not perfect, but at least it shrinks the tree down some. You can see you can see it a little bit better. So you can see that that complexity. A lot of our branches are going all the way out to a depth of five. Not everybody. So here's a branch here that already has a, a Gini score of zero, so it, it's already doing its job by the time it arrives there. Um, but not all of the leaves are, uh, are showing nice differentiation. Most of them are. Actually, actually, at this stage, all of our leaves are showing real good differentiation other than this one here. So there's, um, we have a total of four samples, two in the positive and two in the negative. Uh, and so our Gini score is 0.5. Okay, but at, at this level of complexity, uh, as nice as decision trees are as far as looking at them, by the time we start to grow pretty big trees, it, as a human, it starts to get hard to really interpret what's going on. All right, so I, I did want to show you one other thing before we move on to the next bit. And that is uh, our decision tree classifier doesn't, and max depth, as, as we talked about, it sort of invites having well-balanced trees, whether or not they make sense. There are a variety of other choices you can make for, uh, for regularization parameters. One of which is uh, is max leaf nodes. So I, I'm I'm going to go ahead and set max leaf nodes. Let's go ahead and set that to five, and see how well our model does. 
there's our scatter plot. It's not really doing a good job of this intermediate zone here, although it has it's done a good job of, of handling these regions here. So, it's, so that's not so bad. We'll look at the model here. Our AUC is at 0.88. There's our ROC curve. So it's a respectable curve. And now we'll train up a single model. And here the, the boundaries again are much more uh, crisp. Okay, so the the key observation here is that we have a very unbalanced tree. In in fact, uh, it's just a sequence of question nodes with uh, with decision with uh, leaf nodes hanging off uh, at various points. Uh, there's no case where, uh, other than along this path, this primary path, there are no other question nodes. So, so this is a very simple model. It's done a reasonable job of uh, distinguishing the positives from the negatives. It's still missing uh, uh, some of the, the uh, more subtle structure. So let's play with that parameter. I'm going to double uh, max leaf nodes out to 10. So this is still a, a pretty small uh, model. And there's the, the scatter plot. And you can see now we're, we're getting this uh, intermediate zone. We're filling that in with our negative labels. And our AUC now has gone up to 0.93, which is starting to approach what we were able to do with the very large uh, trees that we were looking at uh, just a moment ago, where we were constraining just the depth of, of the tree. There's our ROC curve. And, uh, and now let's uh, create just one tree and visualize that result. Okay, so so the the structure has gotten a little bit more complicated. There's some more uh, interesting branching here, um, but there is still this primary branch that that uh, where we have this very large sequence of questions, and the only two questions that uh, that don't fit in that uh, along that path are this one right here and this one uh, over here. Um, but this model is uh, even though it's it's deep, it uh, is quite a bit simpler than the other models that we were looking at. So so that gives us uh, a bit more hope as uh, in in terms of uh, this being the right kind of model. Uh, and it also gives us some hope in terms of uh, interpretability. Okay, so we've we've kind of pushed this particular example out uh, about as far as uh, we should with the, on the video. Uh, I encourage you to play with some more of the parameters and try out some of the other regularization uh, techniques to see uh, how uh, how the tree shapes uh, are changed. Okay, so the the other thing I wanted to talk about was an example with the with the baby data, and this also you'll find this as tree dash scale uh, in the Git repository. Uh, again, I've brought in our decision tree packages, and pretty much everything is the same as far as the pipelines go. Let me get through that. All right, so, so the new bit of code that you haven't seen before is this filter data set. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I encourage you to go back and look at that uh, at, a, at a later point in time. Uh, essentially, uh, what I do is uh, this keep variable here. It's just a, a Boolean array of, of trues and falses or ones and zeros uh, that decides whether or not to keep, it, it indicates whether or not we want to keep the uh, the sample in the data set for uh, training and validation purposes. Um, we're, we're using this uh, label onset uh, G. So this is, uh, these are the uh, events where we gesture, a recognized gesture triggered the robot. This where function says, give me the indices uh, for which this particular thing is true. In this case, it's a, there are ones there, so uh, those are considered true. 
And then I'm looping over each of the events. So, so this is really, I have it labeled as the, the variable is called events. It's really event time. And uh, what this says is go into our keep variable and, uh, and go to elements uh, one after the event occurs out to 26 steps after the event occurs and set the values to zero. So we're not going to keep those um, because the, the robot has started to move and that's going to affect uh, the positions and uh, velocities of the infant's limbs and trunk. And then the other thing that I'm doing is going into the label before the label itself at, uh, at the event was a one. And now I'm going in and saying, let's go uh, 10 samples into the future uh, up to the, the current event and set all of those to one. So, so, the, so each sample here is 20 milliseconds. So we're going to look over uh, a 200 millisecond time period uh, at the, uh, of the baby's positions and velocities, we're going to consider all of those uh, trues. And, and fundamentally, that comes down to the fact that babies aren't moving all that fast, and 200 milliseconds isn't going to make a, a huge difference. This is going to give us a larger count of uh, positives. Of course, we have to be a little bit careful because we, we do have some real autocorrelation here. All right, the final step after we've looped over all of those events is that uh, I'm using where again, I'm, I'm asking uh, which uh, elements uh, in, in keep are greater than zero. So those are all the ones. Uh, and where is then telling me which of those we want to keep. So these are the indices of the samples that we're keeping. All right. Here's selecting the, the data. And the new thing that, that you haven't seen before is now, instead of selecting all samples, I'm just taking the ones that, that, uh, that we've selected. And now let's build a classifier. So this is a, a considerably more complicated problem. Uh, but let's start with a max depth of four. So there we go, we've built that classifier. And uh, I'm going straight to estimating probabilities. This, the, the data set is bigger than the example we were just doing, so uh, it takes a little bit longer to execute. There's our uh, confusion matrix. We really want that mass to be down the sides but we've got this huge amount of mass uh, on, uh, that are in, the off, in one of the off diagonal elements, so that's a concern. But let's look at uh, the results uh, anyway. So here's the, the de desired label. That the, visually, it's changed a little bit. This, these periods here that are slanted, this is where we've edited out time uh, immediately after we've, we've uh, triggered a movement of the robot. We recognize the gesture, triggered the movement of the robot. So there's really not any data uh, in, in this region here and likewise here and et cetera. But what we do want is for, the, uh, for this region here, to, while this line is low, we want to have an other label. And, and when it's high, we want to have a movement label. And, and we're not doing a very good job in this particular case. Compute log loss, and then compute our ROC curves. So there's our TPR and FPR. The KS distance is not quite 0.2, so that, that leaves uh, something to be desired. And there's our ROC curve with our area under the curve, which is right, right here. So that's not a particularly exciting uh, result here. All right, and then finally, I'm going to retrain the classifier using all of the training data and generate the graph so we can look at what we end up with. Just wanna make sure that I have the right file. Oops, model.dot. So, so model, I was just confirming that model.dot dot was in the right location here. So let's convert that to a, a PNG. And we'll load that up. 
You can also, uh, in addition to generating uh, PNGs, you can also generate uh, uh, PDFs, uh, PostScript files, encapsulated PostScript files, et cetera. Okay, so the, this, we allowed a, f a fairly good depth, so it's a fairly complicated, a fairly complicated tree. The particular features that it's looking at, it's just telling us what the indices are. Ideally, we, we would actually have uh, true labels for uh, each one of those. And, and when we're actually doing a f more full analysis of these kinds of trees, we definitely want to be uh, inserting those, uh, those labels in here, especially when we're presenting these kinds of trees to uh, domain experts. We want them to be able to understand what it's doing. So, so this one here, there's a good diversity here. Gini score is close to zero. Here, there isn't much diversity. Gini score is close to 0.5. I'm just taking a quick look at uh, all of those Gini scores. So, so there's a mix of uh, of uh, nice Gini scores that are close to zero, uh, and uh, other Gini scores that are uh, far away from where, where we really want to be. So, so what this is sort of asking for is uh, a tree of some more uh, type structure. So let's let's give that a try. So let's give it, for fun, we'll give it a max depth of 10. That's gonna take a little bit longer to compute. You can see now we've done a better job of having, uh, having some green up, up along the top, in particular during periods where the true label is, is, uh, is low here. It's interesting that uh, that it wants to label all of these samples as uh, as red, even beyond the re region uh, of time that we're actually censoring the data. So that might suggest that we want to censor some more uh, data, but that's uh, that's something that one can analyze later. Log loss has actually increased, so things have gotten a little bit worse. And there's our TPR FPR. And, and remember that our AUC was at 0.56, which leaves a lot to be desired. We've now inched that up a little bit to 0.57. This uh, ROC curve has not really changed all that dramatically. I'm not gonna go uh, export the, the, the model for visual analysis because the depth of 10 is really hard to get at. Okay, so, so one can continue uh, this game. We went going from a, a depth of five to a depth of 10. We squeaked out a tiny bit of better performance, but not uh, all that much. Uh, I wanted to play with uh, max leaf nodes here. And let's, let's start with, with 10 of those. So, so that's a pretty moderately sized uh, tree. So that should train up relatively quickly. Our confusion matrix really hasn't changed all that much. And there is our, uh, our probability as a function of time. Uh, even in the, this region here where, where it should be, we should be seeing uh, uh, no movement. Uh, so it should be all labeled as green up here. Um, there are certainly periods where red is appearing. So, so it's still not doing a, a great job. Our log loss, though, has dropped uh, considerably, so that's a good sign. And let's compute our TPR and FPR. Uh, we're still down around a KS distance of 0 0.2, which uh, leaves, uh, which says we're still not doing all that well. Uh, and then our ROC curve, actually, we have essentially the same area under the curve. However, one of the takeaways here is that we, we had a, a model before, we were directly comparing it to a model with a max depth of 10, uh, and now the new model has a max number of leaves of 10. So we actually, we have a much simpler type of graph. Let's look at that. And, and yet we're still achieving uh, reasonable performance. So there, there's our graph. There's a certain degree of balance at the top end, but you'll notice that 
it, it has uh, this extra little bit here that's handling some finer uh, exceptions. The Gini scores, there's a diversity there that, that sort of suggests that maybe we want uh, a, a little bit more uh, structure here. So, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. Let's uh, increase the complexity of the tree. Um, I'm going to go up to uh, 50 here, max leaf nodes of 50. So that'll take a little bit longer to compute that, but still probably a lot faster than our max depth of 10. And there are our predictions. We're seeing a fair amount of red up uh, along the top here in places where we expect green, but that's, uh, that's okay. Let's ask what the log loss is. Our log loss actually has gone up. Uh, quite a bit. Let's compute our ROC curves. Not, not a huge difference as far as our TPR and FPR goes. 0.57 originally for our, uh, for our area under the curve. We've actually dropped a little bit now, so that's not really a, a particularly nice model. Um, just for fun, I'm going to push this up uh, a little bit more and see if adding uh, additional structure actually uh, improves things. So again, this will take a little while to uh, to learn. So that was that was about ten seconds or so. So here's our our temporal plot. Uh, seeing a lot more green along the top. So that, so that tells us something about uh, the improvements in our model. The the reds that we're seeing are often coupled with these plateaus, which is what we want. We do expect red here on the negative case. Uh, log loss was seven before. It's increased. Ouch. Kind of expected things to get a little bit better. Our TPR and our, and our FPR have uh, changed their behavior. So there's clearly this a whole bunch of samples that are sitting right in, uh, right in this area here that that are getting a score of, of one. Not sure what, what exactly is happening in that location, but it, is, it does look kind of like it's a, an odd uh, behavior. Let's look at the ROC curve. Our ROC curve actually looks quite a bit healthier, and we've gone up to an AUC of 0.64. So, so that gives us a little bit more hope that uh, the models that we're learning are actually doing something uh, that's that's interesting. For fun, let's do one more. I'm going to double this. This is going to end up with a very complicated tree. That's probably going to take about 15 seconds or so to execute. There we go. And our log loss now has gone up again to 14. And there are FPR and our TPR curves. That's not really very promising. I bet our ROC, our ROC curve has gone down in performance to 0.59. So we've definitely gotten to the point where, where our models are starting to overfit the, the data pretty uh, dramatically. And in general, this is one of our challenges with individual trees. Uh, in order to capture a lot of uh, structure in the data set, we need to uh, we need to have a fairly complicated uh, tree, but because trees define very hard boundaries between one case and another case, and can give very different answers for those two uh, branches, uh, the the trees can actually be quite brittle. So a sample that's sitting right near that dividing line, if we add a little bit of a noise to it, it might trip over to to the other side of the line, and yet things have not really changed all that much. So this is going to give us uh, some motivation for uh, our next uh, set of videos where we start looking at using not one tree, but a whole set of trees to make predictions. But before we do that, let's get into uh, regression with uh, trees.